Hello, and welcome back to Neural Data Science. I'm Professor Aaron Newman. Today, we're going to be learning about single unit data and spike trains. This chapter introduces data obtained from recordings of individual neurons, which we typically call single unit data, the units being neurons. Single unit data is typically analyzed in terms of spike trains, sequences of action potentials. In this chapter, we will learn how spike trains can be represented as data and some ways of working with and visualizing them. As well, the chapter extends our knowledge of Python, including working with NumPy arrays and complex figures with multiple subplots, as well as further discussion of the use of color and other considerations in scientific visualization. Our learning objectives break down into three categories. With respect to spike trains, by the time you've completed these lessons, you should be able to define spike trains, explain how spike train data is recorded, describe two ways of storing spike train data, time series and spike times, generate two types of visualizations of spike train data, raster plots and histograms, interpret raster plots and peristimulus time histograms, or PSTH, with respect to experimental manipulations, generate 2D heat maps of PSTHs, work with data sets comprising thousands of rows, generate correlation matrices of spike train data for multi-unit recordings. In terms of your Python learning, by the end of completing this lesson, you should be able to create and work with data in lists, NumPy arrays, and pandas data frames, use nested list comprehension, use subplots to plot multiple levels of data in a single graphic, and generate data images with plt.imshow. In terms of data visualization, you should be able to make informed decisions about accessible design and scientific visualization, including your choice of color maps and interpolation methods. All right, so let's get started. As you know, neurons communicate by generating action potentials. Action potentials are also called spikes because when they're recorded, they manifest as spikes in the electrical recording, transient changes from a baseline level of voltage to a different level and then a return to baseline. And we don't really care how big a change it is because the change is typically of a fixed size. We just care whether the neuron has fired or not. Neurons have a negative resting potential, meaning that their intracellular space has a negative voltage, it has more negative ions, like chloride, relative to the extracellular space, which has more positive ions, like sodium and potassium. When an action potential occurs, ion channels in the neuron's cell wall open, allowing the intracellular space to become more positive. Thus, the neuron depolarizes when it fires, and its voltage moves closer to zero. The sodium-potassium pumps of the cell wall then repolarize the neuron to its resting negative voltage. Spike trains are recordings of action potentials from electrodes inserted in the brain. Often, these are from intracellular recordings, meaning that an electrode penetrated the membrane of a neuron and records its action potentials. In other cases, spike train data may be from extracellular recordings, in which the electrode is inserted into the brain but does not penetrate a specific neuron. Instead, the electrode is located in extracellular space between the cells. In this case, the electrode will likely pick up action potentials from multiple nearby neurons. Extracellular recordings are commonly done with arrays of closely spaced electrodes, such that multiple electrodes pick up the spiking of each neuron, but based on the proximity of the neurons to the electrodes, each electrode likely picks up action potentials from only a subset of the neurons that another electrode does. A process called spike sorting is applied to the data after it's recorded to attempt to identify spikes from different neurons based on which electrodes detect which spikes. Spike train data are binary. Either a neuron is spiking, it's on, or it's not spiking, it's off. Even though technically the membrane potential of the neuron rises continuously from its resting state potential to a peak value and then declines again, as shown in the figure above, the data we work with is binarized, so it's either spiking, a 1, or it's not spiking, a 0. You can make an analogy from this to Boolean types in Python. Boolean variable is either true, a 1, or false, a 0, just as a neuron is either spiking or not. This is distinct from many other types of neural data, such as EEG or fMRI, or even local field potentials recorded from implanted electrodes. Those kinds of measurements do involve continuous changes in values such as voltage or fMRI measurements. So they're different. They're continuous variables, whereas in this case we're working with discrete binarized variables. Spike data, or spike trains, ultimately consist of information concerning the times at which spikes occurred. Broadly speaking, there are two forms of this sort of data. In what we'll call the continuous form, we have data at every time point over a time period. For example, if we have a two-second period covering one trial in an experiment. 
At each time point, the data is either 1 or 0, depending on whether there's a spike or no spike. In the discontinuous form of data, the data are instead represented as the time points at which spikes occurred, the spike times. The assumption is that nothing happened, and we only encode those time points where there's news of a difference, in other words, when a spike occurred. This is a much more efficient way of representing data, since we don't need to have data points for all those time points where nothing actually happened. Regardless, however, both are valid ways of representing the data, and we'll see them both in this unit in the textbook. If you want to learn more about spike trains, how they're recorded, and their role in neural data science, I encourage you to check out the links in the textbook. All right, so in this lesson, we're going to introduce spike train data and learn how to work with it a little bit and visualize it. First thing we're going to do is import the libraries we need. So we'll import matplotlib.pyplot as plt, and we'll import numpy as np. Those are the two packages that we're going to use, matplotlib for plotting and numpy for doing numerical uh, kinds of operations. All right, now moving on to our first spike train. Here we're using some synthetic data, so made up data, but we're imagining this is from an experiment where we recorded activity from a single neuron on a single trial that was 20 milliseconds long. So we start the recording at time zero and we record every millisecond whether or not a spike occurs for the next 20 milliseconds. This is, we imagine, from an experiment using optogenetics, which is where you genetically engineer a neuron to respond to light. So when you shine light of a particular frequency or wavelength on it, in this case, 550 nanometers, which is kind of a yellowish green color, the neuron is more likely to fire. And in a later lesson, we'll see that as well, the brightness of the light, the intensity actually affects how likely the, the neuron is to fire. So anyway, in this experiment, we have one trial right now, and the light was turned on four milliseconds after the recording started, and the light was on for 10 milliseconds, and then it went off. And so what we'd like to do is visualize the data and see if the neuron responds to the light, and in particular, when it starts responding to the light. So there's typically a little delay between when the stimulus comes on and when the neuron comes on. Okay, for our data, we have a, a spike train defined as a variable, spike underscore train equals, and we're just storing the data in a list. And although I encourage you to type in most of the code that we're working with here, because you do learn better, in the case of data, I think it's a better idea to copy and paste the data because that way you don't risk making errors. I'm going to paste it, and then we're going to type in the next line, which is just to see what's the length of this list. Spike train. And the length is 21, because as I said, we have a data point at time 0, then at time 1, time 2, etc., all the way up to 20 milliseconds. So we have 1 to 20 plus the 0 time point. So the first thing that we're going to pull out of our data is the first spike latency, or the latency of the first spike relative to the stimulus. This is a characteristic property of neurons that scientists often look at. So in order to do that, we're first going to define some experimental parameters so that we can use these in future bits of code. This is a, a generally useful thing to do if there's particular timing parameters about your experiment that you know you're going to need to use. You define them at the top of the file that you're working in. So we're going to define light onset time as 4 milliseconds. That's when the light the stimulus came on. We're going to define stimulus duration as 10. So that's the duration of the stimulus is 10 milliseconds. And finally, the spike value. So what value in the data set indicates a spike? And that's a 1. Run that cell. And now we're going to compute the latency to first spike. So latency to first spike equals spike train. So we're going to reference the spike train list. And then we're going to index. We're going to slice the list so we only have the data points starting from when the stimulus came on. So we're going to say light onset time, which we defined up above as 4, colon. So that'll go from light onset time to the end of the list. And then we're going to apply the dot index method and pass to it spike value. So you may remember dot index 
finds the index uh, in the list of the value that you give it as an argument. So spike value. So in this case, it'll start at time point four and search forward in the list until it finds the first occurrence of a one, and it'll return the index of that one. Then we'll print the results. So print first spike latency to stimulus. And since the first part of our print statement is a string, we want to convert the latency value, which is numerical, to a string type. So str and latency to first spike. The first spike latency to the stimulus is 5. So if we look back up at our list and we ignore time point 0, 1, 2, and 3, the light came on at time point 4. From there, so we start counting from there, starting from 0, because it's Python, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And indeed, that's where the first one is in the list relative to the stimulus onset time. The next thing we want to do is find the indexes of all the spikes. So not just the first spike relative to the stimulus, but when any spike occurred in the data set. And to do this, to find everything in a list, we need to use a loop because that dot index method only returns the index of the first occurrence of something in the spike train. So to search through the entire list, we're going to use a function called enumerate. I think we've seen this before, but I'm going to show you here how it works. Basically, we're going to say for i comma x in enumerate spike train. So normally for a for loop, we might just say for x in spike train, and it would loop through each item in the spike train list and apply the body of the list to that. When we do for i comma x in enumerate spike train, what enumerate does is it returns two values each time through. So it returns the value from spike train, but it also, uh, and that would be x in this case, so kind of the second output that's returned by enumerate. The first output that's returned by enumerate is i in this case, that's what we're assigning it to. And that is the index that basically tracks how many times through the list you've done. And in other words, it's indexing the position in the list that you're currently in. So the first time, the first list entry, i will be 0, and x will be the value of the first entry in the list. Next time through the loop, i will be 1, and x will be the value in the 1 position in the list, and so on and so on. So here, uh, we're just going to see what enumerate generates by printing the values of i and x each time through the loop. And so you can see, like I said, first time through, and the first column is all the i values, the enumerated values. So it just goes 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 20. And the second column here is the actual values from the list, and you can see the few spikes as the ones. Okay, so what we're going to do now is use that in a list to actually find all of the spike times. So we're going to define our accumulator variable first as an empty list. We'll call that spike times. And then we'll say for i comma x in enumerate spike train. And then we'll say if x is equal to the spike value. So in other words, if the current entry in the list is a 1, spike times dot append i. So we're using append to add an entry to our accumulator variable list, and we're going to append the index position in the list that we found that one in, if we did find a one there. And then outside of that loop, I'm going to print spike times. And there you see we get 9, 11, 13, and 17, which are the positions of the ones in that list. There's another way to do the same thing, which is a list comprehension. We've seen list comprehensions before. This one's just a little more complex, but basically we can fit both our for loop and the nested if loop inside a list comprehension and run what we did up above in one, two, three, four lines of code, all in a single line of code. So here we say spike times equals, and as a list comprehension, we start with uh, square brackets. Everything's inside those square brackets and the result will be this list. And we say i, so we're going to append i to the list for i comma x in enumerate spike train if x is equal to spike value. 
Okay, so it's basically the structure from the nested for and if statements. For i, x, and enumerate spike train, if x equals spike value. We've just put that all in one line inside the list comprehension. And if x equals equals spike value, then it adds i to the list. And again, we'll print spike times. And we see that we get the same output as we did before, which is great. So it's another way of doing it. And the advantage, as we'll see later, is when you have a single line of code, it's easy to use that inside other commands in Python. OK, so now that we have our data and we're able to find the spikes in our data, we want to visualize them in a plot. Visualization is a more effective way of making data interpretable. Obviously, with a single spike train like we have here, it's quite easy to see when the spikes occurred. Although it is, it requires a bit of uh, sort of mental gymnastics to think about when did the stimulus come on relative to that point, uh, when did the first spikes occur. A lot easier to do this visually and just show in a plot when did the spikes occur and also draw when the light came on. So the first plot we're going to draw is a raster plot. And this is a plot where the x-axis is time. So it's basically your timeline of your trial. And you draw vertical lines wherever a spike occurred in time. So we'll say fig comma ax, so our good uh, practice object-oriented plotting with matplotlib, plt.subplots. We don't need to give it any arguments. And to plot the lines, we're going to use a matplotlib function called vlines. So ax, because we want to draw it to the axis, dot vlines. And the three arguments that you need to provide to v-lines are the times that you want the vertical lines drawn at and their start and stop uh, positions along the y-axis. So in other words, where's the bottom of the line and where's the top of the line? And so we want to draw lines at the positions on the x-axis corresponding to spike times. And we want the lines to span the y-axis from 0 to 1. And finally, plt.show. And there we have it. Now, we've got our vertical lines, but one issue is that we'd actually like to show the whole time series on the x-axis. In other words, we'd like the x-axis to start at 0 and go up to 20, since that's the actual time range of our trial. So we can do that, and we can add some labels as well, because it's always important to label your, your axes and things like that, so that anybody viewing the plot has the ability to understand what you're showing. So here we're going to use the same axe vlines command to draw the lines, but we're just going to add some more code to make the plot better formatted. So fig axe equals plt.subplots axe.vlines, same uh, arguments here, so spike times and span from 0 to 1. But now we're going to axe.set xlim and we set the x limits as the left hand side of the x axis value to the right hand maximum value minimum to maximum as a list so it's inside square brackets here zero and then for the end we're going to tell it take the length of the spike train then on the next line ax.set X label, so we'll label this x axis as time in milliseconds. And we'll add a title to the plot, so we'll say ax.set title spike times. And finally, plt.show. There we go. So, same plot, but now we start at zero, go to 20, and we have a label on the x-axis. Another thing that is nice to do, and this time I'm going to copy my code from up above since all of this is the same, put it down in the next cell, but we want to show when our stimulus came on. We know that the stimulus came on for at 4 milliseconds and it was on until 10 milliseconds, well for 10 milliseconds after, so actually until 14 milliseconds. So what we're going to do to show when the stimulus is on is we're going to add shading, like background shading, to the plot in a color that matches the color of the light, because that's an additional way of communicating to your viewer what the stimulus was, as well as when it was on. And uh, we're going to use a command called axe vspan to do that. 
So first, uh, since axe v-span, as you see here, it wants when the shading starts along the x-axis and when it ends. We have the white onset time defined as one of our experimental parameters from up above, but we don't have the white offset time defined. We just defined when it started and how long it was. So we're going to define light offset time as equal to light onset time plus the stimulus duration. And down below, ax dot, and it's actually x v span, light onset time, light offset time, alpha equals 0.5. So what this will do is make the shading semi-transparent, uh, a little lighter, since it's kind of in the background. And color equals green-yellow. And I chose that color out of the matplotlib palette because it's the closest visually to what 550 nanometer light looks like. Run that cell. And now you can see we've got the same plot, but with this yellowy-green shading showing when the stimulus was on. So immediately, this visualization makes it very clear to anybody looking at it when the stimulus was on, and it's quite easy to see the relationship between spiking and stimulus presentation. So having done that with a single trial, now we're going to move on to more trials. In any experiment, we're not just going to run one trial. We want to know what the average response is and what the variability of responses is across different repeated presentations of the stimulus. And neurons tend to respond probabilistically, meaning that they're not machines. They don't respond with exactly the same latency and the same number of spikes every time you present a stimulus. There's some trial-to-trial -trial variability, so we'd like to be able to capture that by recording the data across many trials. So here, what you see is we have 10 spike trains defined as a list of lists. And again, because this is data, I'm going to highlight that, copy it, and paste it, run that cell, and so now I've got data from 10 spike trains. Each of them are the same length, starting at zero, going up to 20 milliseconds. Okay, so now to plot this as a raster plot, we can do basically the same thing that we did before, but we're going to loop through the trials and draw a raster plot for each trial. And up above are vertical lines for the spikes, spanned the whole range from zero to one on the y-axis. But in this case, because we have 10 trials, we want basically 10 rows in the raster plot, one for each trial. So we're going to make the span for those vertical lines only about one unit high. And the number on the y-axis is going to correspond to the trial number that that data is from. Okay, so let's work through the code. So fig comma ax equals plt dot subplots, just to define our plot. And then we'll do our for loop to loop through trials. So for trial in range going the length of 10 spike trains. So that'll basically go through, it's a list of lists containing 10 lists. So that'll go through the list 10 times. We'll say spike times equals, so this is the same list comprehension we used before. And this is, it, it just saves space in our code by using the list comprehension approach as opposed to the nested for and, and if statements. So spike times is i for i comma x in enumerate 10 spike trains. And here we add indexing for trial because 10 spike trains is a list of lists and we want to index specifically the, let me scroll this up so you can see it better. We want to index specifically the list for this particular trial. Okay, so move outside those parentheses, but stay inside the square brackets for the list comprehension and add our if x is equal to the spike value. So this is just the same code we used before to find the indexes, or in other words, the times of the spikes on each trial. And ax dot vlines spike times, comma, and here's where it gets different before we did from zero to one. Here we're going to use the trial number as our sort of index to say where on the y-axis we want it. And we go from minus 0 0.5 
to trial plus 0 0.5. So what this is doing is it'll draw a line that is one unit high, starting from just below where the, the trial number to just above. So in other words, that line will be centered relative to the trial number on the y-axis. And then we'll do the other formatting thing. So axe.set xlim. And this is the same as before. So we want it to go from zero to the length of spike train. We're going to set the x label to be time in milliseconds. And we're going to axe.set y ticks. So another matplotlib parameter setting command. Uh, and this is because we want a tick on the y-axis for every trial number. So it's very easy to tell which row in the y-axis corresponds to, to which trial. So here we're going to say y ticks is equal to the range of the length of 10 spike trains. ax.set y label and that'll be trial number. Set the title for the whole plot to be neuronal spike times. And finally, we'll add our shading. So ax dot ax v span and go from light onset time to light offset time. Alpha to make it 70 transparent and set our color. And finally, plt.show. There you have it. So again, we have our raster plot. And what's different now is we have different rows for different trials. All right, so this looks quite nice. And that is essentially a raster plot. So looking at the raster plot now, you can see that across many trials, the latency to first spike appears to be, and maybe we should have set our X ticks differently since we didn't actually acquire data at time point 7.5. But regardless, the first spike latency seems to be eight or maybe nine milliseconds relative to the start of the trial. So that would be four or five milliseconds relative to the start of the stimulus. And there does seem to be a relationship between the light coming on and the, and the response of the neuron in that prior to the light coming on, there's very few neural responses, only one. And after the light coming on, and certainly after four or five milliseconds, there is a very consistent response across trials. You can see there's some variability in the timing of the response, but probabilistically, we could say that the neuron's probability of firing increases as a result of uh, shining the light on it. So the next thing we're going to do is a different kind of plot where we're going to basically generate a histogram of how many spikes occurred at each time point across all of the trials. To do this, we're actually going to convert the data from a list of lists to a NumPy array. We could have actually started with a NumPy array, but since we're more familiar with lists so far, we started with the list, and now we're seeing how that can be converted to a NumPy array. So what is a NumPy array? You can think of it kind of like a pandas data frame. It doesn't have the ability to label the columns or the rows. And in this case, we're working with a two-dimensional NumPy array. So it has rows and it has columns. Now, arrays in principle can be more than just two-dimensional. So you could actually have a three-dimensional array. So imagine uh, you know, the, the 2D array of rows and columns but then many of those going back in depth. So sort of a cube of data rather than a, a square or a sheet. The reason that we're going to work with the data in an array format rather than as a list of lists is that the, the arrays are provided by the NumPy package and NumPy is heavily optimized to work with arrays and it gives us a bunch of mathematical functions that make it very easy to work with arrays and do things like compute histograms. Whereas with lists, that's a little more difficult and ultimately a lot slower to run. So it's quite easy to convert the list of lists into uh, an array. So we're going to define spike array as being equal to np.array 10 
spike trains. So in other words, we're just passing the list of lists to a function called NPArray, and that'll make a NumPy array. And then we'll print the NumPy array, so print spike array, and we'll also ask what's the type of that array. So you can see the array looks a lot like the list of lists in that we have one sort of overall enclosing set of square brackets, and then each trial is in its own set of square brackets. Visually, when you look at this, what tells you it's an array and not a list of lists is that there's no commas. So lists have to have commas separating the list elements, whereas when you print a NumPy array, you don't see those commas. You just see spaces between them, and likewise, you don't have commas between each row. So each, in, each sort of inner set of square brackets in this array is one row, and then the columns you can see quite easily. And the final output here, numpy.nd array, so it's the, the type of this is a numpy array. nd stands for n-dimensional because, again, this is a two-dimensional array, but numpy supports three-dimensional and even higher-dimensional arrays as well. There's a little bit here about why numpy arrays. So I already talked about some of that, but basically numpy is faster, much faster than working with lists of lists, and it scales well to very large data sets, whereas lists don't. NumPy has many tools that are optimized for working with arrays, which makes it easy to do a lot of things that you might want to do in data science, and it also makes them work faster. And finally, NumPy is extensible, so as I said, it can handle data with more than two dimensions and many, many rows, many columns, so very large and complex data sets. Okay, so now we're going to draw the histogram, which when we're dealing with spike train data is called a peristimulus time histogram peri meaning around, so basically relative to the stimulus, over time let's plot a histogram of how many spikes occur at each point in time. So this is a way of aggregating across trials, whereas with the raster plot you see the data for every trial. So it's a way of summarizing and getting more of a sense of the general response pattern of the neuron across many trials. So to do this, again, we'll start with fig comma x equals plt.subplots, v span from, so this is our shading, from light onset time to light offset time. Alpha is semi-transparent. We don't actually need the leading zero when we're doing a decimal like that. And the color is green, yellow. So now we're going to draw the peristimulus time histogram itself. So we're going to do that using a, a bar plot. So ax.bar. Later we'll see how to do it with an actual histogram function or a histogram plot function. But for now, a bar plot is fine because that's really what a histogram is. And the bar plot takes two arguments, the x-axis and the y-axis. What do we want to plot on each? So on the x-axis, we want to plot time. And so that's basically the range starting at zero and going up to the length of the spike array, so the length of each row. And the way we'll get that is how many columns are there in each row. So we'll say spike array dot shape. Shape is a property of the array, and so we don't need parentheses after it, but we're going to index that shape with one. And we do that because spike array dot shape will return two values, the number of rows and then the number of columns. And we want the number of columns because that's how many time points we have. And a comma. Oh, not inside all the parentheses though. So comma. And then the second argument is the y value. So to get that, we're going to say np dot sum. spike array, comma, zero. And we need our final parenthesis to close that ax.bar command. So basically what that's going to do is sum across some dimension of spike array. Specifically, that second argument is what dimension to sum across. And we're saying zero, meaning sum across the rows. So for each column, we're going to get the sum of how many spikes were there in that column or that time point across all the rows. And then finally, we'll make the graph pretty by giving it titles and labels. A 
x label has time in milliseconds, x dot set y label as number of spikes. I'll simplify my title relative to the example there. And finally, plt.show. So there's our peristimulus time histogram. Shading there seems a little light, and that's because I did an alpha of 0 0.05 rather than 0 0.5. Much better. Okay, so now this tells us essentially the same information as we saw in the raster plot. But now because the number of spikes is counted for us, it's quite easy to see that the maximum response occurred at 9 milliseconds, and there's a strong response starting at really at 8 milliseconds, so 4 milliseconds relative to stimulus onset, and going basically up to the end of the stimulus. And then after that, there's actually a, a drop in spike rate, and then it seems like another increase. And that's not unheard of. It's actually not uncommon for neurons to show what's called an offset response. So they respond when the stimulus comes on, but they also make a response after the stimulus goes off, as if they notice that difference as well. Okay, so this is shown in terms of the actual number of spikes, so the raw number of spikes, which in this case the maximum was seven. So one thing that we may want to do is normalize our histogram. We've seen histogram normalization before, and basically what it's doing is scaling the y-axis so that the height of the bar represents the proportion of trials that had a spike rather than the raw number of spikes. So if the neuron fired on 8 out of 10 trials, then the height of that bar would be 8, and the maximum it could be is, is 10. And for a single histogram, this doesn't matter so much because we're not comparing it to anything else. But if you have different neurons or different conditions that you want to compare responses to, it may be uh, useful to normalize the data this way so you can sort of quote unquote, compare apples to apples rather than looking at the raw values because some neurons may just spike more overall. And so their raw values may be a lot higher, but the general pattern of the responses or the timing of the responses may be the same as some other neuron that fires less often, but its sort of relative probability of firing in time is similar to the neuron that fires more. So to do this, we're going to use the same plot command that we used up above. So let's just copy and paste that down below. The only difference is that instead of using np.sum to compute our bar height, we're going to say np.mean, because the mean is out of the total number of rows, in this case, in the NumPy array, how many of them uh, had a spike in it. Run that. And you see the plot basically looks the same. All that's different is now the y-axis is in proportion, so decimals, rather than raw numbers. And the final thing that we're going to do in this lesson is combine these two plots. So we're going to create one figure with two subplots. One of those subplots is the raster, and the other subplot is the histogram. And we'll start by fig comma axs equals plt dot subplots. And now we're going to specify the number of subplots we want. So we're going to do two rows and one column. We're going to make the fig size 10 by 5. So we're just explicitly setting the figure size to consider the fact that we want it to be uh, an appropriate size to show these two subplots. And then we're going to do axs square bracket 0. So remember with multiple subplots, we have to index the axes to be specific about which one we want to plot into. Dot AX V span light onset time light offset time alpha equals 0.5 and color equals green yellow. And then we're going to do our, our raster plot. So in fact, what we can do here is just copy the code from our raster plot up above. Let's find that last raster plot. copy the axe v-span because it was already here. And so we're changing ax to axs0. So we just have to copy that and replace that in all of these lines. Okay. 
And now I'm gonna add a comment and just say PSTH, just so it's a little clear. And again, we're basically taking the code from our previous peristimulus time histogram. Put it down here. And now we just have to make, well, we don't want the subplots. We just make each of these AXs to be AXS square bracket one, because now this is the second subplot that we want to draw. Replace that in all of the other things. And then the other things that we'll do are we'll add fig.subtitle and that puts a figure sort of a superior. So it's a, a, a title for the overall figure. And with multiple subplots, it's a good idea to always use plt.tight layout to ensure that plot elements don't overlap between the different subplots. And finally, plt.show. There we go, except I forgot to change the ax in ax.vlines to axs square bracket zero. So that's why the raster didn't show up there. There we go. So now we have a raster plot and a peristimulus time histogram, and we can directly compare the two of them. So that brings us to the end of this lesson. Thanks for watching. And in the next lesson, we'll carry this forward by working with data from more intensity levels. So now we're going to look at these raster plots and peristimulus time histograms but across multiple levels of an experimental condition. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.